so much, Wes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. As Wes mentioned, my name is Milena Stereo. I'm a professor at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law and also managing director at the Public International Law and Policy Group. And it is my pleasure to moderate this panel on issues of diversity and inclusion in peace processes. This panel, as Wes mentioned, is jointly sponsored by two American Society of International Law interest groups, the Transitional Justice and Rule of Law, and the Minorities and Inter International Law interest groups, with generous support of the society more broadly, as always. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone, and please allow me just a few moments to briefly introduce our esteemed panelists, and then we will move, on, move into the discussion itself. We have, to this, we have with us today Hawa Gauss, who's a senior advisor in the Office of Global Criminal Justice at the US Department of State, where she focuses on transitional justice, international criminal law, and international humanitarian law. Prior to joining the Department of State, she worked on human rights and humanitarian issues in the nonprofit sector, and later for the government of, of, of Afghanistan from 2006 to 2009. During her tenure at the State Department, she has managed large-scale justice sector reform and gender justice programs, served as the Chief of Staff to the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs, advised senior officials on justice sector reform, human rights, and transitional justice. She has also worked in the field as a senior rule of law advisor across four provinces in Afghanistan. Welcome. Next, we have Dr. Dipali Mukhopadhyay, who's a senior expert on the Afghanistan peace process for the US Institute of Peace and associate professor in global policy at the Humphrey School at the University of Minnesota. Her research is concerned with the relationship between political violence, state building and governments during and after war with a geographical focus on Afghanistan and Syria. She's vice president of the American Institute of Af Afghan Studies and a term member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She was also on the faculty at Columbia's, Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs from 2012 to 2020, and a visiting scholar at NYU Center on International Cooperation in 2016. Next, we have Professor Paul Williams, who is the founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group, and also a professor of law at both the law school and the School of International Relations at American University in Washington, DC. As a renowned peace negotiations lawyer, Paul has assisted over two dozen parties in major international peace negotiations and has advised numerous parties on the drafting and implementation of post-conflict constitutions and the construction of transitional justice mechanisms. And last but certainly not, not least, we have Professor Darren Johnson, who's a senior legal advisor at the Public International Law, law and Policy Group and also a professor of law at Howard University in Washington, DC. Professor Johnson served as chief of staff in the office of the special coordinator for Middle East transitions when it was newly formed, which was tasked with coordinating US assistance to politically transitioning countries in the Middle East and North Africa following the Arab Springs uprisings. Prior, he had served as the legal advisor to the US embassy in Baghdad, Iraq. The format of this panel will go as follows. Each of our panelists will get a few minutes for their opening remarks on this very important issue of um, inclusion, diversity, and peace processes. And after that, I have some follow-up questions for our panelists. And then towards the end, we are also open to receiving your questions and we'll do our best to, to address um, your questions as well. So without further ado, um, let me turn it over to Hawa. Hawa, please share with us some of your prelim pre preliminary thoughts regarding the importance of diversity and inclusion and peace processes. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all the all the folks who came together uh, for this wonderful um, concept, and I'm happy to be here um, joining this distinguished panel. Um, so, I, I mean, I think it's hard to argue that diversity and inclusion is not important to a peace process. Um, but you know, we know that any negotiated settlement, um, you know, hinges on aspects that uh, that that tailor to the needs of the folks who have been coming to the table. And we can get into um, some of the complications there in terms of you know, who is allowed at the table. I think that's always um, uh, the very difficult uh, sort of nut to crack from a practitioner standpoint. Um, but I do think it's incredibly encouraging to see more awareness around the issue of diversity inclusion um, in the peace process and also in a negotiated, ultimate, ultimately the negotiated peace settlement. Um, we understand that any successful peace process must be tailored and context specific in order to work. 
in this sense, it's quite difficult to apply any one model to another conflict or another context. Um, and so increasingly, I think people are becoming more aware of the specific um, uh, grievances in each country and how that will be uh, paramount to any negotiated peace settlement. Um, and diversity and inclusion is, is of utmost important in that sense. Um, and what we see is from experience that to have a durable and credible peace agreement, we have to have maybe not every single party to a conflict uh, present at the peace table, at the peace negotiation uh, at all times, but they have to have some type of meaningful participation. Um, and, and that can get very tricky, but having that as an ultimate goal at the outset, I think is really, really important. Um, and as a wide range of members of society have a voice, uh, their grievances can be examined. Uh, credible agreements must be tailored to deal with the root causes of the conflict. And we see often members of minority groups having a vested interest in this as they're often their targeted victims of conflict. So not having minority voices at the table and feeling like they are part of the process um, is going to be very problematic down the line. Uh, we must also be sensitive to different models of justice and decision making in each context. So, for example, I think coming from the Western perspective, we are very much used to individual based decision making and and concepts of justice, whereas we see in other countries that that really isn't the case and that people are much more um, interested in community based decision making. And so we need to figure out ways to make any type of peace process and negotiated settlement sensitive to that type of um, community-based thinking. Um, and finally, I'll just say that I, I think, you know, given all of this, a top-down and bottom-up approach to peacemaking is critical to achieve that durable uh, peace agreement that is seen as not only inclusive, but transparent and, and long-lasting. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Dipali, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Milena, for inviting me, and thanks to all for the conversation. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to these two concepts of inclusion and diversity from the perspective of the Afghan peace process and or the lack thereof, really. And I guess I would start by saying I think the U.S. government's approach to the withdrawal from Afghanistan effectively made inclusion and impossibility um, for anything resembling a peace process. Um, what we saw instead was the, top, the United States locking at least theoretically together the ideas of a withdrawal of US forces to the, the found, laying the foundation for an inclusive peace process, a set of talks, negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And instead, um, Ultimately, the, the negotiations between the US and the Taliban took precedence for both parties and left the Afghan government entirely at, on the sidelines of the conversation. And the agreement um, in 2020, that um, the so-called Doha agreement, that then laid the groundwork for the American withdrawal effectively set the stage for the collapse of the Afghan government once the American troops departed. And so I think any conversation about inclusion, um, if, if we think about the most basic concept of, of inclusion, the most basic articulation of inclusion as simply respecting the sovereignty of another state, in this particular case, um, we've fallen short already. So larger conversations then about who should be at the table and whether they're from representing particular groups or gender or particular positions becomes almost a secondary or tertiary concern in that case. <laughs> and the result of that has been, I think that you can draw a straight line from the failure to actually encourage an inclusive process to the collapse of the Afghan government and to the humanitarian crisis that we now see unfolding on the ground. And anything resembling a nod to diversity has then really amounted to a kind of tokenism or a performativity where particular individuals who have been deemed to represent quote unquote Afghan women or quote unquote Afghan minorities or civil society, broadly speaking, 
are invited to particular fora um, in most recently in Norway and in, in Geneva um, and before that in Doha with the Americans in terms that don't really actually allow them to, to give voice to the huge plurality um, of interests and positions that actually may have made up Afghan society. And so I think until we really reckon with the fact that U.S. foreign policy and U.S. war making and peacemaking continue um, to engage with, with other countries as less than sovereign, I don't think we're really going to make a lot of progress beyond um, at a fairly superficial level in, in moving on, on these questions of diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. And we will certainly have time to return to some of these themes later in this conversation. Paul, would you like to go next? Great. Thanks, Melina. Um, I just wanted to amplify what Hawa and Dapali have been saying in terms of the need for inclusivity uh, and diversity in a peace process in order for the agreement to be durable and to highlight how difficult that really is. You know, I think we, we've been in so many experiences, those of us on this panel, where the negotiations have been, you know, with the guys with guns. And there's a question of, you know, well, where's the gender diversity? Because it is mostly guys with guns. Uh, where's the inclusion of refugees, IDPs, marginalized populations, youth? And, you know, my experience is the way in which these negotiations are designed, it's a focus on getting to yes, ending the war, not so much on getting to a durable peace. You know, the words that Hawa was using, you know, how do you get to a durable peace? And there's, there's genuine tension when the mediator's like, look, I just got to stop the conflict. I just got to stop the war. I just got to get the guys with guns to agree to a ceasefire. But the difficulty is that urgency of, of stopping the conflict really does undermine the sustainability of the peace and will lead to a longer, longer term peace. You know, it's, it's it, the, the difficulty, the, the complexity of, of having a genuinely uh, inclusive, which is the second point I want to talk about, a genuinely inclusive peace process uh, is sometimes seen as insurmountable by the mediators or the parties that are trying to get the, uh, the belligerents to agree to something on paper. And so I would encourage us all to be thinking about how do we actually design a peace process that's inclusive uh, in an effective way? I think UN for Women uh, Milena, when you and I were in Juba doing our work on the, uh, on the peace process there, we saw a very effective way that the United Nations was engaging uh, the UN Women uh, Coalition. Uh, when we were working on the Syrian peace process, there was a commitment by the Syrian opposition to have a certain number of, of their delegations uh, be women, to have 30% of the delegation be women. They also had an external women's caucus that they brought. Uh, so they brought the armed actors and they brought a women's caucus. You need those types of mechanisms in place to ensure that there is a seat at the table. And you can't just go for symbolic representation. Uh, we've seen that in many situations where the delegation will be eclectic and there will be women, youth, marginalized populations, but they're all from the same party. They all have the same interests. And then you don't actually get the value of having an eclectic and a diverse array of voices and interests and constituents as well as people. And so it's, it's twofold. It's breaking the mold of let's just get to yes with guys with guns. And it's once you do have an inclusive process, ensuring that it's, it's inclusive of identities, interests, constituents, and perspective. And that's how you're actually going to get a lasting peace agreement. Great, thank you. Darren? Yes, thank you, uh, Milena. And, and first, uh, let me thank uh, ASIL for organizing this wonderful panel and also the Transitional Justice uh, Interest Group. Um, I'd like to just uh, echo uh, the comments of all of my colleagues on the panel and just emphasize um, in particular the context. And so when, when I think about peace processes, right, I also think about um, broader democratic transitions uh, and the typical circumstances uh, that we see 
um, in which uh, we have situations of conflict or authoritarianism that give way to a democratic transition. And so when I think about peace processes, I also think about you know, corollary um, democratic transition uh, mechanisms, right? Like constitution making, like the standing up of um, different transitional justice mechanisms. And I, it's important to realize that in nearly all the contexts in which we see uh, the need for a peace process or for um, a constitution making process or for a new transitional justice mechanism, we're typically dealing with circumstances where there has been um, exclusion and oppression, right, of minority or marginalized groups or women. And so when we look at the underlying circumstances of exclusion or marginalization, I think it's important to realize that the solution, right, to get to a durable peace or a durable um, democratic transition is that the process of getting there um, must involve diverse parties and most often those same parties who have been excluded and who have felt the need to resort, resort to arms or who have felt a need to um, topple a government through popular protest. And so it's really reconciling those longstanding grievances, which are often rooted in exclusion of marginalized groups and marginalized populations um, that makes um, a successful and durable peace process, the, the inclusivity, um, a fundamental aspect of it. And so I'll look forward to, to elaborating on those comments later. Thank you, Darren. Um, I would like to next ask about specific examples of peace processes that you can that you have either you know participated in directly or worked on you know remotely or or just a, are aware of specific examples of peace processes that in your opinion were inclusive or were not inclusive and essentially the consequences of that. So let me go in reverse order. So Darren, Paul, Depali, and then Hawa. Yes, thank you, Milena. Um, so I uh, have had the pleasure of, you know, working both with you and Paul on the recent peace process in Sudan. Um, and, you know, through working on that process, through uh, meeting in Juba with clients and working with, you know, parties on, on both sides of the conflict, um, you know, it's really, I think the Sudan peace process is representative of, of many of the peace processes that we'll, we'll hear about today. Right, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, right, oftentimes the folks at the table, right, are the the guys with the guns, right, the guys who are involved in the 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 military conflict, but the broader interests, right, of the peace process, which oftentimes shapes the nature of the democratic transition through decisions made at the table, right, decisions like decisions about governance, decisions about. Um, uh, what transitional justice will look like, decisions about resource sharing. Those are interests that um, all individuals, uh, in this case in Sudan, have. And so one of the challenges is, you know, how do you pull in um, the individuals who maybe weren't um, the guys with the guns who are involved in the immediate conflict, who are the parties to the specific negotiation, but may have been the individuals who are actively engaged in the popular protest um, that helped to topple, um, in this case, um, Bashir, right? And to create space for uh, the peace process. And so one of the ways in which that occurred was, you know, interestingly enough, um, the, the new uh, transition government um, was consisted of, right? Members of uh, the FFC, right? The forces for uh, the FFC, which was the, the political group that helped to, to topple Bashir. Many members of the FFC became part of the then transition government and were at the table um, during the negotiation. And so they were able to um, speak to the interests of some, some of the groups who weren't um, necessarily uh, in the strict day-to-day -day negotiations, right? There were also opportunities where, um, as was mentioned, the UN and other groups brought in uh, women and marginalized groups and people from regions to also serve as observers, right, during the negotiation and to almost stand uh, in the room as a voice of uh, morality and conscience, 
as these very important decisions were being made that affected them. And so I think um, these mechanisms of bringing folks to the table, even if they're not in the day-to-day -day negotiations, but making sure they have an opportunity to observe, to comment, um, and to serve as kind of a moral influence or moral suasion uh, uh, is a great way of ensuring inclusivity. Yeah, and before going to Paul next, I would just point out, emphasizing something that you just said, and I think Paul touched upon this earlier, but when we talk about peace processes, what I have in mind here, there's sort of the immediate ceasefire, and that might be the guys with the guns and, and, and those participants might not be particularly diverse, but there's also a broader approach to this. There's sort of the broader end goal of actually achieving peace. And so I think these issues of um, uh, inclusion and diversity are important to both of those aspects of the peace process, the immediate ceasefire, but then obviously also the ultimate end goal of achieving a, a durable peace. Paul? Melaine, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, the notion of a ceasefire since that relates directly to the sort of the story that I want to tell about both an inclusive and then a non-inclusive process and it being the exact same process. And this is the case of, of Yemen. I was the uh, had the opportunity and the pleasure to be the legal advisor to Jamal Benamar, who was the UN envoy for the Yemen negotiations. And the Yemenis had structured a national dialogue. It, it was truly astounding at how amazing the Yemenis were in terms of bringing in over 500 different uh, participants from all over the country, highly eclectic, highly diverse, highly empowering. And I remember turning to one of my colleagues on the, uh, on the mediation team and I said, wow, there's no going back. You know, there's nothing better than this type of inclusive national dialogue process uh, that sort of had the attention of the country for nine months to break the, the bad old days, the bad old habits, and really to create an inclusive and a dynamic process where you know, all of the views were, were heard, the, the outcomes, there are 2,400 outcomes, it's an 800 page document. Fast forward two months later, and we were in the exact same venue, the Moven Pick Hotel, doing the ceasefire negotiations with the Houthis, between the government and the Houthis, and we're sitting there and looking around and it's back to all of the guys with guns. And you went from the exact same place, the exact same hotel, you know, 500 eclectic dynamic to a ceasefire negotiation and it's just the guys with guns. And the envoy leaned back and he was sending a few text messages. And I was like, oh wow, it's not only my students who text <laughs> in class, it's the envoy who texts in negotiations. Uh, and about 15 minutes later, there was a bang on the door and 12 women from the women's delegation busted in and said, wait, you're, you're violating the protocol that we've established in this country of having inclusive negotiations. And no kidding, one of the gentlemen said, oh, no, this is man's work. And of course, the envoy was like, bring over some chairs. Let's create a fourth side of the table because it was a it was a horseshoe. We've gone back to traditional horseshoe. And he basically had a staff bring in a table and put a bunch of chairs and instantaneously made that process inclusive. But if it wasn't for the envoy, the Houthis and the government were perfectly comfortable doing the man's work of the ceasefire in a non-inclusive and non-transparent non way, for that matter as well. But because the women's delegation had been so actively uh, energized through the national dialogue, and because they had sort of the assistance of the mediator, Jamal, they were able to get a seat at that table and get them to focus on more than just where do you draw the line and who gets what territory. Great, thank you. Dipali? Yeah, so I, I said a few words or in my opening comments about the, about the Afghan process and the failure to include the Afghan government, and then, of course, as by extension, the Afghan citizenry in that process. And I thought maybe I'll say say a few words about the Syrian experience, which is the the subject of of my second book, which is was sort of looking at how did members of the Syrian opposition, not just those who were engaged at the highest levels by the West, but those who were living inside Syria and governing themselves um, in small municipalities for many, many years. How did they conceive of these processes? And over and over again, I think what we, what we heard from them was the notion that to be included and to be heard required them to perform, uh, to, be, to be the right kind of opposition, 
um, to be quote unquote moderate, to be able to speak English, to be able to understand the kind of terminology of good governance and of peace building that is so much a part of the donor community discourse. And that many of them felt even if there were individuals who came from their town, came, represented their sectarian group, represented their ethnicity, that fundamentally they were not actually represented because those who were most engaged by the international community and by Western donors were outside of the conflict and had were physically often outside of the conflict set up in Turkey over the border um, where anyone who's worked on Syria knows this is sort of the space where a lot of the activity was happening in southern Turkey between 2011 2016. Um, but also in many cases were members of the diaspora who had not lived inside Syria for many years, were in many cases um, hadn't suffered and taken the risks and paid the costs of what it actually meant to stand up against Bashar. And so I think it's important to also think when we think about what does inclusivity mean and what does diversity mean, that it's not just a sort of a function of the demographics, right, of, of who somebody represents in theory, but also how anchored are they in their own communities? To what extent have their communities, do their communities feel that they have the authority to speak on their behalf? And to what extent are the people that we, we wanna think about as bringing diversity, visually creating a tableau of diversity and inclusion, but once you peel that back a little bit further, are actually very much removed from the profoundly difficult experiences of, of living through war and in, in the case, Syrian case, of taking that unimaginably courageous step of, of rising up against an authoritarian regime. Thank you so much. Hawa? Sorry, thank you. Um, let's see, I, in terms of um, models, I mean, I think it's, again, very difficult to pick out models, but I think, you know, one of the, one of the models that we look at a lot in our office is the Columbia model uh, that some hold up as very successful and others say, wait, 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 no, you know, there, there, there's a lot here that, that still needs to be done. But um, I think, you know, one of the things that the Colombians did was bring in women very early on in the process and have that grassroots um, interaction with the FARC. And, and, and if, you know, they, they had one-on-one -on -one meetings, they had group meetings, they had this sort of um, uh, you know, building of relationships that no one thought could no one ever imagined could happen. And I think some of that um, did contribute to certain aspects of the peace agreement that, that, that um, you know, maybe um, led to a more inclusive, um, 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 you know, ultimate settlement. But also, I mean, again, like going back to, to Polly's point, like when you have the time and you have the political will from, from all sides, um, to be more inclusive and and you you have sort of the the resources both at the top down and bottom up um, levels to to work on some of those very very difficult problems together um, that's when we see this work and unfortunately in a lot of contexts especially contexts where the the peace process is in, in essence taking place outside of the country um, and there are other um, uh, players involved that can get very, very difficult. And um, both in terms of resources, time and political will from not just from the men with guns, but from, from others involved as well. So I think um, that is one, one model that we, we sort of look at and we, we try to learn from, but it's, it's very difficult to apply it to other situations. Thank you. Now, I think that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, easy to agree that having an inclusive and diverse peace process is incredibly important. But I think the more difficult question is, how do we get there? How do we actually achieve this, right? So what are some of your thoughts on this and, and, and some of your practical recommendations, if you will, as to achieving this end goal of having um, inclusive and diverse peace processes? So let me switch the order again. Um, Hawa, you can begin, and then we'll go to Polly, Paul, and, and Darren. Uh, 
I mean, I think that's the the ultimate question. Um, I would say, to me, one of one of the things I would like to see more is, um, uh, you know, precursor processes to a peace process. So, how can we start some of these conversations and and um, relationship building and you know discussing of grievances and so forth in a way um, that is informal? Um, quite frankly, I mean, there there was some of that in the. Um, you know, uh, Afghanistan context as well early on where, you know, um, you had Taliban for the first time sitting across from um, uh, war widows and, and not to say that in any way that was successful, but there, there were things that took place that had, you know, that could have been um, capitalized and, and used um, in, in the long term. Um, but I think there, there should be more of that. There should be more informal discussions and relationships, um, uh, you know, before other folks come to the table and before it becomes a much more formal process. Um, I think that and, of course, more time and resources. Thank you. Dipali? Yeah, I mean, one one suggestion I think would be to, to not anoint particular individuals for years and years and years to be the designated representatives of, quote, women or civil society or X minority or Y minority group to recognize that at each forum, in each gathering, each set of invitations that get sent out, that there is an opportunity there to think more broadly about the voices that can be included. And technology allows for that now and social media allows for that and thinking beyond English speakers, thinking beyond people who have visas already or are already living in the West. I mean, these kinds of really, these, these sound like technical things, but I think they allow for a genuine sort of plurality to emerge. And the other is, is not to reward regimes and actors who are only doing this in a token fashion. You know, the Taliban will only sit down now um, with civil society groups when they're invited to a European country. If they're not willing to have those meetings in Kabul with their own constituencies, they shouldn't be given private jets to fly to Oslo, right? To, do, to perform that kind of engagement um, in ways that legitimize them without having really earned it through genuine inclusive engagement. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Melina. Just two very specific recommendations that whomever is mediating should initially make a public and irreversible commitment to inclusivity. If you look back at you know, the last dozen or so peace negotiations, there's mumbling about it around the margins of the press conference or if they're specifically asked. But they should show up and their, their, you know, their third talking point after welcome, we're here to do a peace agreement. The third talking point should be I, the mediator or, or my institution are making a public commitment that is irreversible that this process be inclusive. And it will probably take three times as long as a traditional peace process but it's also going to last in perpetuity as opposed to just for three months. And then the second is for the international community to be serious and those of us that advise parties on, on negotiations on capacity building. When I was working on a constitutional negotiation, it was a technical experts group of 17 and there were four women um, delegates and they came to me and they said, you know, you know we're interested in, in capacity building. I'm like, well, yeah, great, but you have all these, these entities and these organizations around helping with capacity. And they're like, they're all teaching us how to be women. We got that part down okay. This one, our colleague is gonna uh, take the lead on transitional justice. This colleague is gonna take the lead on federalism. This colleague is gonna take the lead on security sector reform. Can you work with us to build up our capacity so we're not only at the table representing women's issues. And then even within these substantive areas, we're not simply representing women's issues in TJ or women's issues in, in security sector reform. But we're, we're, we wanna be experts at the table on whatever the question is, because that's the end game. We have our views, we have our constituencies, we have our perspectives, but we want those reflected in the substantive topics of transitional justice, security sector reform, uh, designing a federal, a federal state structure. And I think we have to, as, as those of us that are providing assistance and guidance, 
uh, have to not rush so quickly to empower whichever particular group it is, women, minorities, or other disenfranchised populations uh, to represent their disenfranchisement, but also to have them engage on the substantive topics. Thank you. And Darren, you have the last word on this question. Um, well, I, in a very important question, Milena. I, you know, I think that we can draw some parallels to kind of best practices in related spaces. Um, you mentioned earlier in my work uh, in the office um, helping to support the Arab Spring transitions. You know, I've done some, um, in my later work, I've done some analysis of those constitution making processes in Egypt, Tunisia, um, Libya, and Yemen. And one of the things that I think uh, can be observed in the constitution making space, which um, you know, many view in contexts where states are coming out of authoritarianism and, and into democratic transition as their form of a peace process is something called participatory constitution making, right? And so the idea of participatory constitution making is we want to ensure that the process for making the constitution is transparent. We want to ensure the inclusivity and the representation of the parties at the table um, drafting this new body. We want to make sure that there is some public endorsement, right? Even if it's not ratification, that there's a public process where the public can comment and ideally in endorse the constitution. And I think the strength that we see of these best practices in the constitution making space are the same ideas that we can see um, in a more traditional uh, peace process. Um, and I think, you know, to kind of harken back to your earlier question about, well, what doesn't work? You know, we can see that some of the dangers in a constitution making space that's, you know, exclusive and that um, is secretive and that does not take account of representative bodies. We've seen certain contexts where those secretive, exclusive new constitutions have actually helped to bring about greater conflict, right? And so, you know, in Egypt and Libya and Yemen, we saw that occur. And so I think we could draw the same parallel to a peace process, right? So if we're not uh, ensuring some public, con um, public consultation or comment or some form of public endorsement, if it's not a transparent process, if there's not representation, the peace process itself can unfortunately become a source of even greater conflict. And so I think, again, some, some great lessons can be learned from the participatory constitution making space in the, in the space of peace processes. Thank you. And just following up on this question of how do we get there, um, are there specific actors in the international community that can help, for example, um, we've already mentioned, I think Paul mentioned UN Women. Um, there are other groups as well. You know, so I think Dipali or Hawa had already talked about the US government, like US policy. Um, can, can these actors in the international arena, can they act and essentially help to shape these processes so that they are inclusive and, and diverse? And let me again switch the order. So there and Paul, Dipali and Hawa. I think absolutely. I think um, one of the, the one of my co-panelists mentioned earlier, right, the importance of both a top-down and a bottom-up process. I believe it was Hawa, and I think that's absolutely right. Right, these pro peace processes need to be responsive, absolutely to um, the needs of the um, constituents and of those you know who are most invested in a successful process of those on the ground. Um, but some lessons learned. Right, and some um, expertise can be brought to the table uh, from the international community, whether it's you know, organizations that are serving um, as consultants, right, or as legal advisors, or whether it's uh, entities like the UN that are actually helping to host um, the processes and can, can actually help the parties to negotiate um, both the day-to-day -day agenda as well as to reach agreements um, through um, you know, kind of the, the terms of the negotiation on who can be present. Uh, I think the international community can play a very important role in helping to, to influence the parties to, to ensure the transparency and the inclusion that we've talked about. Um, I'll, I'll just mention Sudan again, right? That was a, a, a context where it was actually the government of South Sudan, right, who was um, hosting and mediating the agreement. 
but we had uh, representatives from various parts of the UN who are serving as experts who are helping to facilitate and reserve space. And so, and, and organizations like PILPG, which were um, serving as uh, advisors and consultants. And what, what I found and what I saw was that the uh, participants really do want, right, both uh, the expertise from the international community, but many times they actually want um, the international community to uh, endorse, right, and to, uh, to endorse the ultimate agreement. And I think because of that interest um, in having uh, support, whether it's from international institutions or from governments, that uh, those observers and advisors can use that influence to um, ensure that the process um, is as transparent and as uh, inclusive as possible. Thank you. Paul? Thanks, Melina. Uh, I'm going to go off the board for 15 points and pick World Bank. Uh, and the reason why I say World Bank, it's the, the very first peace negotiation I was working on was the Dayton negotiations. It was the lawyer for the Bosnian delegation. And we were in Packy's restaurant having pancakes for breakfast. And I sat down next to someone and I asked her, oh, so which delegation are you with? And she said, I'm the World Bank delegation. And I'm like, wait, there's Bosnian Serbs, Croats, the EU, NATO, the World Bank delegation. She said, yeah, I'm a delegation of one. I said, well, that's great. That's interesting. Uh, what's your role? And she said, the rest of you are going to design a peace agreement and I'm going to pay for it. You're going to turn to the World Bank and say, we need a post-conflict trust fund. We need the World Bank to manage it. Write a check. I'm here to make sure that you don't design some crazy non-implementable agreement. Of course, that didn't stop us <laughs> from designing a non-implementable agreement, but it got me thinking that, yeah, there should be a World Bank delegation and not just a delegation of one, but you know, two or three at every peace negotiation. The development community should be involved in the peace negotiations because they're the ones who are gonna say, we're here because you're gonna make us fund it or ask us to fund it. Uh, we know that we wanna return our investment, our return being peace, and if it's just the guys with guns, we're wasting our money. It's a junk bond that we're investing in. If we really want to invest in uh, a sustainable uh, enterprise, that enterprise has to reflect the views of all of those in the conflict, not just those engaged in the conflict, but those victimized by the conflict. So I'm going with the World Bank. Thank you. Dipali? Yeah, so I'll, I'll come back to, to the US government and European governments in, in this case and say, you know, I think they're some of the most powerful players in the world. So of course they're in a position to convene fora in terms that are more reflective of these norms of diversity and, and inclusion as we are increasingly understanding them. They're also the most likely to walk away um, when their own domestic audiences interests shift, when their national security concerns shift. And there's something that a number of scholars who've been looking at peace processes and interventions from the Balkans through to Libya would, would say, which is there's a kind of moral hazard that these states introduce that individuals, ordinary citizens and activists and political figures and members of the security sector in these countries take risks on the assumption that if they are engaged by Western governments, that means that these Western governments are in fact committed to seeing through uh, a transformation of politics from being waged on the battlefield to the peaceful management of conflict. And when those states, as they have in case after case, encourage individuals to participate and include them and engage them as part of an effort to create a, a more diverse space. When they leave, they are leaving their interlocutors on the ground everywhere from Afghanistan to Syria to Libya um, out on a limb and profoundly exposed. Um, and that is to displacement and to torture and to death. And, that is a responsibility uh, that I don't think Western states take as, as seriously as they should. Thank you, and Hawa? Yeah, I mean, I, I just 
you know, would like to pause and, and just acknowledge what Dipali just outlined. And I think it's incredibly important. And, you know, on the one hand, I think we, we, wa we all want to do the right thing. And I think, you know, there are, there are really important aspects of leverage involved with getting foreign countries um, uh, to help facilitate. And I think all the parties um, understand that. And that's why they, you know, are, are always encouraging um, foreign countries to be involved in the processes. But ultimately, we, we see this not the end all be all, you know, so how, how can we make it a, a more localized process? Um, I think ultimately, in the long run, we need to see more of that. Um, how to do that, it's not clear. And there aren't a lot of very good models to use. But um, you know, I think these these ongoing conflicts um, won't be resolved until we have um, more attempts by all parties involved to to get these um, these 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 processes to be more localized because we we can't we can't we can't outsource these functions and and we can't uh, rely on on others to solve these problems and to get everybody to do the right thing, particularly when there's no um, there's no political will um, for with many of the parties involved, including the men with the guns, right? Um, and and so um, yeah, I, I just think I think that's why we have to go back to more localized participation. Thank you. Um, we're closely, you know, inching towards the end of this hour, but we have time to address a few of our audience questions, in particular those that I think we haven't um, talked about already. One of the questions has to do with the role of observers. Sometimes in peace processes, there are groups that are there not as direct participants, but as observers. What type of influence would they have? And in particular, how can their influence be relevant for these issues of diversity and inclusion in these peace processes? So I'm gonna direct this to all of our panelists. And if you would like to answer, just um, you know, raise your hand and, and let me know and I will call on you. Darren. Yeah, I, I think um, observers can play an important role in two ways. One, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the moral suasion, right? The fact that you, you know, having people in the room with a direct interest in an issue, um, even if they're not the specific negotiating party, right? Their presence and their ability to share their perspectives uh, can influence uh, the, the eventual agreement. Um, and so that's from the perspective of observers who are, you know, uh, local constituents, but there are also international observers, right? And so international observers, um, as I noted before, can help to, you know, set the terms of the negotiation. And they oftentimes, you know, if we're talking about, you know, transitioning states, uh, there may very much be an interest in moving from, let's say, a pariah state status to a status of legitimacy, right? And so that desire to have um, better uh, bilateral relations um, and a, you know, let's say a lifting of sanctions and other things can also influence uh, ultimately the final text of an agreement. Great, thank you. Would any of our other panelists like to weigh in on this point? If not, we have a few other questions. Um, one has to do with the role of civil society organizations. Can civil society organizations work to promote more awareness about these processes when they occur so that people from diverse demographics will know that they have the opportunity to be involved in them? Um, so is there a role for civil society organizations locally in particular, where they can perhaps raise awareness and, 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 and allow um, these diverse groups to, to participate. Yeah, Paul. I think there's, uh, Melina, I think there's quite a substantial role for civil society because they're oftentimes uh, a trusted, if not the only trusted uh, actor. Obviously they have their views, they have their constituencies, but you know, I've never met a civil society actor who also carries an AK-47. And so you could be a government you know, armed actor, you could be a non-government armed actor, but it's the civil society that if they're sharing information about the, the peace process, if they're sharing the information about what's being discussed at the, uh, at the peace process, they're much more likely to be trusted or a trusted voice. So I think this goes, this sort of blends into Darren's comments he was just making on observers. You know, having a civil society delegation of observers present uh, 
And then also having a delegation of civil society participate uh, in the negotiations in some level of capacity. It, it deeply, deeply stresses out the, the non-state armed actors and the government because it's not a voice that they, that they can control. Uh, civil society is also the most fragile uh, most susceptible to either government or non-state armed actor uh, pressure, inducements, threats. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to do what we can to not only empower, uh, but energize and protect uh, civil society actors uh, in these areas. Dipali? Yeah, I would just add that I, you know, I think it's an interesting exercise to expand our conception of what civil society means. I think for in a lot of communities, civil society may be somebody who used to be a fighter um, but and has been rooted in the community for a long time, maybe a religious leader whose views are different from those of um, a lot of those in the intervening kind of community. Um, there are many women who are who have militant politics. So not all women are peace builders, many of them in fact have, have taken up arms uh, themselves. Uh, so, you know, I think there are ways of thinking about, again, inclusivity and diversity in the broadest sense of the term. And if I come back to Hawa's point about what does it mean to really anchor something locally, to really think about in their own terms, what does, what does it mean to be a respected individual in one's community. That will look very different in, in every single context. Thank you. And we have just a few more minutes left. So I would like to invite our panelists to share their sort of closing thoughts on the issue of also ensuring that um, international experts, mediators, those who sort of support and host various mediations and negotiations and peace processes are also diverse because as we have seen over the last um, several decades, if not centuries, that the international cadre of experts tends to be predominantly white male coming from you know, uh, Western European or North American countries. So how do we ensure that we have diversity of representation, not just within the parties themselves, but also within these experts supporting the peace processes. So we can go back to the original order, which is Hawa, Depali, Paul, and then Darren. And I would just encourage our panelists to be brief in their closing thoughts so that we can actually end on time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think, and I hope that it's getting better. I hope there is more diversity. And I think that, um, you know, if there are other students and law students um, listening in, you know, don't give up. I know it's a hard field to break into, um, but it's really important. Um, I'm speaking on, you know, my, my family, they're direct victims of, of war crimes. And this is the reason I got into this work. And I think that having, I, I may have not solved any of these problems through my work, but at least having a voice and, and having people um, identify with me um, in some of these countries and also um, see themselves in me in a way and, and know that it's possible to get involved is, is really important. And I think I've also helped broaden the perspective of some of my colleagues who may not be sensitive to some of these issues. So I just encourage people to keep trying and I, I hope that we do see more diversity in the field. Thanks. Thank you, Dipali. Yeah, um, I really appreciate what Howard just said. I, I guess I would also say, I think, Often we think about other parts of the world as places where these values need to be embraced. And if we actually look here at home, we realize how not diverse and not inclusive and not equitable our own society is and the institutions that govern us and that dominate. And so I think thinking about who we hire, who we cite, who we promote, who we send on missions, all of these are decisions that we have actually much more power over than we do whether or not parties come to a peace in a faraway place. And so a lot of that work, really important work, I think just has to start at home. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think you're seeing a, a welcome shift to more regional uh, mediation, the, the African Union, uh, ASEAN, uh, the Arab League, I think that will then have uh, the knock-on effect that you're, you know, that we're interested in in terms of having a more diverse and eclectic array of individuals engaged in 
uh, negotiating, drafting, supporting, implementing these peace agreements. Thank you. Darren, you have the last word. Yes, I would um, just, I think, maybe pull together uh, those last two comments, um, both the importance of having uh, regional institutions uh, with, with individuals of, of, of various backgrounds serving in these roles, but also from, you know, those parts of the world that, you know, were previously mentioned, North America, Europe, making sure that the individuals who are hired, right, and who are um, part of international institutions are diver uh, diversely represented, right? And so proactive measures, I think, are very important. And these institutions should realize that diversity strengthens, strengthens them. You know, it's not just a, you know, kind of the, a buzzword, um, but ensuring diverse representation actually makes your work product and your ability to achieve your objectives that much stronger. So um, I would call for proactive measures and conscious measures to increase that diverse representation. Thank you. We are out of time, unfortunately. Thank you to our panelists for sharing their expertise on this very important topic of inclusion and diversity in peace processes. And thank you to all our audience members for joining us today. As I mentioned previously, this panel was organized by two ASIL interest groups, the Transitional Justice and Rule of Law and the Minorities in International Law Interest Group. And in particular, I would like to acknowledge and thank the leaders of the Minorities in International Law Interest Group, Ankita Ritwick and Tej Srimushnan for their original idea about having this panel that then we gladly picked up on the Transitional Justice and Rule of Law Interest Group side. We look forward to continuing this very important conversation at a future panel or conference. And again, thank you to everybody for joining.